hadn't the Kaiser had to run away to Holland and his war leader Ludendorff to seek refuge in Sweden? And wasn't Germany now a republic, apparently like our own, based on liberty and equality? Didn't that prove that Carl Schmitt had rid himself of the old German tradition? That's what your father thought as he celebrated in 1918. But let's see what had really happened. When defeat was imminent, the men who had caused the war stepped conveniently into the background, leaving the weak opposition parties to take over. That was how, overnight, Germany became a republic. It had elected representatives, all the appearances of democracy. But beneath the surface, the old German system went on as before. The state officials of the Kaiser's empire were the state officials of the new republic. The industrialists of the empire ran the industry of the republic. Even the same teachers presided over the same classrooms, preaching the same gospel of nationalism and German racial superiority. And above all, the general staff of the empire continued to function, even though secretly. The old Germany still lived, and Karl Schmidt, too, had never really changed. In the first place, he never believed that his armies had been defeated. During the four years of the war, he had been told only of an unending string of victories. News of defeat had been kept from him. And when the fighting ceased, wasn't his glorious army still on foreign soil? Germany itself still uninvaded. And because Germany was granted an armistice instead of being forced to unconditional surrender, Karl Schmidt never saw Allied soldiers marching through his capital. Instead, the German army home again after the armistice. Bands playing, colors flying. Like the army of Frederick the Great. Like Bismarck's army. certainly not like a conquered army. Why then had Germany signed an armistice, Karl Schmidt asked himself. Why a year and a half later, what he called the shame treaty of Versailles? Why was Germany, in his judgment, an undefeated Germany, accepting the penalties of defeat? Bitter, self, Karl Schmidt was looking for a scapegoat. He found one the one the German war leaders had always planned that he should find. Karl Schmidt never blamed the men who had caused the war. Instead, he blamed the men who had signed the peace. Thus, in Karl Schmidt's distorted thinking, the ill-fated German Republic meant a bunch of traitors that had stabbed the fatherland in the back. And the general staff, the great landowners, the industrialists, the state officials smiled contentedly. Not only had they escaped blame themselves, but they had smeared the idea of democracy in Germany. It was a blow from which it would never recover. Karl Schmidt would go back to the old tradition, the tradition of Frederick and Bismarck and the Kaiser, the tradition of militarism and war. But wasn't the Versailles Treaty designed to prevent Karl Schmidt starting another war, even if he wanted to? By this treaty, the Germans agreed to disband the general staff, to limit their army to 100,000 men, to hand over their fleet, to demilitarize the Rhineland and coastal fortifications. They bound themselves never again to build an air force or submarines. And to enforce the treaty, Allied troops were to occupy the west bank of the Rhine, the Cologne sector for five years, the Koblenz sector for 10, the Mainz sector for 15. Further, there was the League of Nations, designed to prevent Germany or any other country from starting a war of aggression. Yet, only 20 years later, the Karl Schmitz of our generation were on their way again for another try at smashing the world into submission. Carl Schmidt able to rearm so quickly. Like every other country after the last war, Germany faced hard times. But in Germany, careful manipulation made its results much worse for the millions of Carl Schmitts. Inflation made clever financiers rich and canceled the huge debts of the big landowners. 
It broke Carl Schmidt. Then came the Depression. That cost him his job. So hunger was added to his resentment and bitterness. This was the moment for which the unholy quartet had waited. Now the militarists, the landowners, the state officials, the industrialists emerged from their self-sought obscurity. Their plans were ready. Now they went to work. What is the cause of your troubles, shouted Schacht of the Reichsbank, the Treaty of Versailles. Who signed the treaty, asked the reactionary newspapers, the Democrats. And why are you starving, said Krupp, the munitions king, to pay for reparations. Who started the war, said the crown prince, the French. Who lost the war, asked Hindenburg, the Democrats, the communists, the traitors. Carl Schmidt listened. He was hearing the story he wanted to hear. He was a victim of a vast conspiracy, he told himself. The world was against him. Once again, he was being taught to hate. Once again, he was thirsting for revenge. And revenge was possible because the world allowed him to tear up the Versailles Treaty, clause by clause. Instead of enforcing it, we Americans refused to sign it and withdrew our army of occupation after only nine months. The British, even though Germany was consistently violating it, pulled out after five years. The French made one final attempt to enforce the treaty and marched into the Ruhr. But this made them so unpopular in a world drenched with heartbreaking German propaganda that they withdrew sullenly behind their Maginot line. Now, let's see what would have happened had the treaty been enforced. Without a general staff, Germany could not have planned World War II. From a demilitarized Rhineland, she couldn't have attacked France or the Low Countries. Without an air force, she could not have blitzed Britain. With an army of 100,000, she could not have attacked the Soviet Union. Without submarines, she could not have threatened our own Atlantic lifeline. But the Treaty of Versailles was not in force. And as for the League of Nations, we refused to join it and other countries paid it little more than lip service. So once again, the Germans began to march. Not in the open at first, but on disguised drill fields, masquerading as patriotic veteran organizations, or as the so-called Technical Auxiliary Corps, ostensibly formed to help in case of strikes, or as Ein Bonerwehr, vigilante groups claiming to protect the citizens against communism, or in school, simply under the name of calisthenics, but always under the supervision of army officers. The old German tradition was on its way back. But to the victorious allies, the German leaders sang a different tune, peace, friendship, and a piteous cry for help. Germany's fate is the fate of the world. Germany's distress is the distress of the world. The prosperity of the individual nations is the prosperity of all. I hope one day to come over to America and visit your beautiful country myself. The German political and economic situation today is extremely difficult. This is the result not only of having lost the World War, but above all the outcome of the fact that Germany's former enemies are oppressing here above endurance. And when the German leaders whined they were too poor to pay reparations, we believed them. Result, not only did they not pay one penny, but they received additional billions granted them in loans. It didn't occur to most of us that they would use this money to build up their industry for another war. We began to sympathize with Carl Schmidt. Why should he suffer because his father started a war? Maybe the Versailles Treaty wasn't fair. Maybe the French had been too tough, or maybe it was the British, or maybe Wilson wasn't very practical. Once again, we were determined to see only the pleasant side of the German character. This clean and tidy people, this musical people, this industrious people, this historic country, this beautiful country. But behind this peaceful facade, the Germans prepared again for aggression. And as 
Germany began to rearm, its leaders planned the death blow for the German Republic. True, they had already taken it over for their purposes, installing the aged von Hindenburg as president, 